Hello and welcome to episode 13 of the Snowboard Instructor Podcast. Today we're talking with Renal, who is a snowboard basey, adaptive trainer and a snowboard trainer herself. We talk about the new generation of snowboard instructors post-Brexit, equality in snow sports, adaptive snow sports and some snowboard tech details as we go through her 23 years of teaching. Alongside this, we have a sponsor for this episode. Watch and Ride is an online snowboarding school which focuses on improving your ability no matter what level you are. With loads of quick tutorials and feedback from high level instructors, you're bound to improve not just your technical ability, but also your knowledge. They also have a fitness program to help maintain your fitness for next season of shredding. As we all know, lockdown has made us a bit lazy. Visit Watch and Ride and use the coupon code Snowboard Instructor Podcast for 25% off your order. We hope you enjoy this episode and have a great day. Yeah, re- year and a bit actually, so um, yeah, it's getting there, yeah. I remember that. Well done, you've done well since then. You're just sort of getting into this. And when I saw it come up on Facebook, I was like, yes, Max, well done. It's always awesome to see, you know, where students are heading in the snowboarding industry. Not all go straight through the teaching platform. Some people just take it for tech development. You know, some people go off and have like you filming, photography. There's so many different corners that people work in in the industry, but it's awesome to see. Oh, by the way, I've been meaning to ask you, um, of course, this is before we kind of get involved with the the podcast. Um, You were in one of the Bayesley working groups, weren't you, right? I was. How how did that go? <laughs> because I was in the communications one with um, Dave Burrows and whatnot. Um, oh yeah. And that went. Yeah, ours went oh. super well. Um, it was good meeting Dave for the first time because I listened to the Ski Instructor podcast quite quite a lot. So it was yeah. good, kind of just slightly fangirling over him and uh, just enjoying his, his podcast. Um, yeah, ours went all right. How yours yours was in equity and quality, wasn't it? That was it, yeah, it was. That was awesome. Um, (laughs) Highlighted so many areas where we needed to work. What I love, I mean, I've obviously got that close to my heart because, you know, I've always been a pioneer on the snowboarding side of things. So I've always been the only woman and, and, um, you know, found it quite close to my own personal experience. And uh, it was really cool to work with people from other fields who were, clued up on that subject and brought their knowledge and their professionalism and their expertise from other areas. You know, we had someone from the armed forces, we had someone from the NHS, um, we had oh, other really high, high, high level professional backgrounds kind of not coming to me right now, but just great to work on that level and work with people who are so passionate about the same subject. Just awesome. Yeah, we um one we did touch upon in terms of um for the communications side, um you know how we could kind of bring in and engage a lot more kind of women um skiers and snowboarders in Basie itself. Um, so we kind of looked upon different associations that are currently doing that. Um, mm-hmm. because I have a lot of knowledge in in the Canadian association and how they kind of work with it. I had a kind of call with a lot mm-hmm. of the the girl snowboard instructors there. Um, and they were super interesting just to talk to and how, how Cassie have kind of done it and how like future focused they were. So I was like, let's kind of implement something that Cassie have done into our equation. And yeah, it's, it, it's going super well. I think it's quite cool seeing like Bayesley, hopefully after with all Brexit and COVID over and hopefully we can get something better with Bayesley, uh, fingers well. crossed. You know, they, I mean, what they, what people don't see behind the scenes with Basie is that this has been a bit of a three three year journey to get to where we are, and it's not just Basie as an association that needs to need changes. It's actually systematic. It's in society. You know, women have always been hidden in Basie um, and in sports in general as not being hardcore enough or cool enough or or whatever you know we were never exposed we were never really invited um to to bring to the table at the higher levels you know it take took years for the female trainers to be invited to deliver the courses at the higher levels um so we were never really celebrated you know as as equals we didn't really have that same exposure 
simply because really, not because there was anything malice, I think. I think it was society and society's expectations at the time. And I think it just, no one thought about it, you know, which certainly isn't any excuse for it not to be done. Women were in the background thinking, come on, when's our turn? Yeah. <laughs> come on, we want to play too. <laughs> it, it's definitely super interesting. You can really see it relating to just the industry itself and it being kind of a very male focused sport and you know it it was that time and it's that classic kind of elitism you get from it isn't it at the same mm. time and that's why um hopefully of course and you are seeing that with like snow camp and of course um loads of riders lots such as yourself um really kind of um bringing up these issues and really kind of making the whole industry a lot more diverse and a lot more kind of inclusive which is really cool to see um, mm. Yeah, what I was going to say with the Basie thing yeah. in 2017, this journey really started. It's quite an interesting story. I was in Zermatt on a trainer's, we know where all of the end of season and we've got all of the courses going and it's yeah. a big Basie scene. And we were at a trainer's dinner and I was sitting opposite um, Amanda Perry and next to Roy Henderson, who was the, who was the trainer's manager at the time. And um, the end of the table, there were so many really inappropriate comments going on at the table and sex, quite sexist, really. And uh, Amanda and I, we didn't say anything. We sort of just looked at each other and rolled our eyes. And and Roy was sitting next to us and he went, he, he clocked it at that time. And so... It, fair play to Roy. He was brilliant. He then contacted me and Amanda and asked if we'd speak at the basic, basic conference on equality and diversity and just to explain what we're experiencing and what's happening in Basie and how that's affecting the women in the industry, you know, how that's affecting the female numbers as they go through the system, et cetera. And I first said to Roy, why are you asking me? No way. I'm not doing that. <laughs> That's awful. I am not because I was speaking to the whole training body, you know, and the, the all of the male Basie trainers in the room. There was over a hundred male trainers, and on the training body, we've only think it's thirteen female skiers, snowboarders, adaptive in total. So um, we're a really small group. And uh, when Roy first asked me, I was like, "No way, I'm not doing that." But <laughs> it was it was brilliant. It turned out so well. I'm just so proud to be part of that team because yeah. it was uh, accepted and heard and acknowledged. And not only that, you know, quite a few trainers took that and ran with it and started some women's groups and women's support um, courses. And like Tom Waddington, Waddington for example, he, he ran off with the idea and went, great, I love this, I'm going to do all these things to support, you know, women in the industry. And I basically just highlighted what it's like for women yeah. when they're about to, or when they're on a basic course and they're training, it's hard enough on the training, really. We just want to focus on getting down to good riding. We don't want to have to focus on all that other crap. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <It goes in. laughs> so I guess I was just a bit of a spokesperson for women to highlight what happens for students and, you know, and what happens to trainers. I mean, I've, I've turned up at a, um, a course where we do the welcome meeting on level two. And I once had uh, a student come up to me straight after the welcome meeting and ask to change groups to have a male trainer because he didn't believe I could teach him anything as a female. So, yeah, that's, I sound a bit sexist, I suppose, but I'm not. I love writing guys. <laughs> it's, just, it's just what's happening out yeah. there. <laughs> It, it it's it it's mad how how much stuff changed and it's it is really interesting especially towards it, how how it's going to be in the next like five ten years it's it's quite exciting in that way um, oh yeah it's to definitely see um yeah and I'm I'm just kind of rooting for everyone at this point and just hoping snowball and just gets like even more kind of better and more demanding so there's more more you know work for everyone in the industry and you know adding that diversity is just going to help so much as well um mm. yeah i i'm all for that as well and, and i really think it is going to change you know the world's changed now with covid people are thinking differently i mean so many people are all so mind-based 
go, 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 go. And COVID's taught people to be in their heart more and, and, and just be more and follow what's right. I think people are starting to really question their lives and question, you know, what is right out there? They're, they're talking a lot more about environmental issues, equality. You know, it's, people are choosing things which feel great in their heart rather than going for money grabbing or, you know, following the ego. So, so that's great. And I believe I'd love to see snowboarding like it is in China. Yeah, you know, in China, yeah, it's so mad. Yeah, on the mountain on snowboards. Yeah, we've had a couple of uh, people on the podcast who were talking about China and Japan. I'm like, I really want to go now. And just looks yes. so good. Uh, just like seeing so many people just like really, really hyped about it. <laughs> yeah. It's so, so exciting, actually. It's really, an, it's a, China's really interesting. I went twice um, to, to examine snowboard instructors and also represented Basie um, there as well. Um, the food, I mean, everyone talks about the food, but yeah, it's a really interesting place to be. The, the students are awesome. They're so into snowboarding, like, Stoke level is just off the scale <laughs> constantly. Yeah. <laughs> and they're so dedicated to development, focused. They're such awesome students. So, yeah, it's definitely a one you must go. But I recommend taking with you some dried porridge. Okay. Like, go on. <laughs> Give me the explanation for that. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Yeah. After a while, the, you can, your tummy gets a little bit sensitive. <laughs> I'm I'm usually all right with a lot of like Japanese and Chinese food because in Birmingham we have a real big kind of Chinese and Japanese uh, quarter and district so there's a lot of restaurants yes. um, and a lot of um, like real kind of genuine authentic kind of um, Asian cuisine which is really cool um, and it's just I, mm. I try and go there every single night if I can um, if not wow. I just usually deliver it um, but yeah it's super cool around there where, um, We've got a night, yeah, it's great for nights out as well. If you want like a, a cheap, like a nice little great sort of like food after you've just had a couple of, um, a couple of drinks afterwards and just, um, something to really set the, the alcohol in, which is really good. Um, I actually spent a bit of time in Birmingham once. I know that. I know that quite well, Birmingham. In fact, <laughs> I worked in Birmingham once. Oh, really? Nice. <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to think when and how that fit into the scenario. For one, <laughs> One summer, I was a market researcher. Nice. <laughs> All over the place, in different places. It was really funny. <laughs> yeah, Birmingham's cool. But yeah, going back to Chinese food, we all, all the trainers who went, we loved, all loved Chinese food. In fact, that was one of the things that drew us there. Um, but after a while, when we got there. Yeah, you started we feeling like, it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In fact, one of the ski trainers, Gareth, love him. He's awesome. He ate fried rice every single day because his stomach just was getting so sensitive with the different oils and the different meats and the different hot pots and all the chili. There's so much chili. <laughs> and uh, he ate fried rice for 16 days. <laughs> <laughs> I bet when he got back, he like really absolutely loved like a, a taste of a, a burger or, or some food by the end of it. Cause yeah. I bet you must be missing out if you're just eating fried rice every single day. Um, yeah, yeah uh, I want to kind of start then um, with um, your history and how you started in snowboarding. Um, so yeah, ta let me tell me, Renal, when was your first snowboard lesson, or how did you get into snowboard lessons? Snowboarding. So many people ask that question. Um, so everyone usually is like, "How does a girl come from the beach in Australia <laughs> to being a baby snowboard trainer?" So I guess. It's kind of kind of a long story. I grew up on the Sunshine Coast, on the beach, uh, literally on the beach. And uh, when I was five, my mother passed away, so my house was mayhem. I had three older sisters and my dad, who who, who you know brought us up, and uh, how crazy in the house. So I was always outside in nature. I lived on the beach, and I was constantly digging in the sand. And my nickname was Pal um, Nelikans because I used to feed the pelicans every morning. My dad was a fisherman and we had all this fish and I'd have my own little herd of pelicans that came every day. And uh, so I always had this love for nature. And I went through school as everyone does and uh, first snowboarding experience was at 18 where my best friend was a travel agent. 
and yeah, which is cool. And she back then in Australia, she organized one of these buses, you know, those like 54 people on a oh, bus yeah, that yeah. had a 16 hour trip down to Threadbow. And uh, the night before her trip, she rang me and said, someone's pulled out. Do you want to come? And um, I was working in law at the time. And I said, yeah, totally. I'm on that bus. <laughs> so we went. And that was your typical drinking trip of 18, partying. Uh, but I do remember first day I went skiing and uh, I looked around at everybody, everything, and I was like, I'm not into this at all. I'd grown up skating and surfing and I was a typical 70s beach kid, um, super surf grom. And um, I saw this one guy who was snowboarding and I was like, what's that? I want to do that because it really wasn't that yeah. popular. So I went around to all these shops trying to find a snowboard as well. And uh, finally I found this snowboard shop and it actually the guy said, well, we don't have anything in your size and I'm not sure if these boots are actually going to fit you. And I said, I don't care, just give it to me. I want to go. <laughs> nice. So then I, and then I was, I actually asked for a lesson, which was fun. Um, and I remember this guy, I mean, I picked up really quickly. I was sort of turning straight away. And I remember this guy telling me to like open and close these pages of a book. And I'm like, what's that got to do with my snowboard? I'm opening and closing the pages and nothing's happening, man. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to turn. And in the end, I was like, um, yeah, I ended up riding with him for a little while. And yeah, so that was it. I was hooked. Loved it. And did you, um, what were the subsequent kind of le like, uh, sorry, trips and resorts after that? Did you go on after? So funny you say that. So I was a real sporty kid um, in Australia, loads of competitions at all levels, regional, state, etc. cetera. And um, yeah, I had a background there as a personal trainer and uh, also worked in law. And then it's a really sort of interesting story. My sister was working out in the Alps and as a chalet girl with her partner. And I, my other sister was working in England uh, and I had another sister as well who was in Mauritius or something. And I decided to do this world tour to visit my sisters. And the last stop was a one week trip in um, Le Clouse where my sister was working. So I went out there and it was almost as if the universe was telling me that's it, you're gonna work in the mountains forever. Because <laughs> when I got there, my sister hurt a knee. And I remember spending one week there and going, I'm not going back to Australia. And I phoned my boss. I'd worked there for seven years in law and litigation. And I was like, that's it. I'm not going back. <laughs> and so I ended up staying for the rest of the season. So thinking of trips, I didn't really do many. I did that one trip when I was 18. Then I did that fill in for the season for my sister when I was 23. After that, I decided I'm working in, in resorts. And so I got a job in a chalet in Maribel. And did three seasons working in Maribel. So how how was um, the experience in Maribel then? Um, if you if you mind, kind of go into a bit more detail with that, if that's all right. Yeah, sure. So that was interesting. We worked in a chalet. I earned thirty five quid a week. Nice. Uh, nice. <laughs> yeah, but I just was <laughs> so dedicated to snowboarding. I loved it. Really looking back, I don't know how I'm not dead actually after. <laughs> After my level of ignorance, I used to just spin off everything, jump off everything, ride everything, not care. You know, your typical first season where everyone just goes out and wasn't really that big on the partying, I suppose, because I didn't earn enough money. So it was always just get out there and ride every day as much as possible, clean the chalet, get out, go riding. And really it was funny, after the at the end of the first season, I got um, for Christmas present, uh, a voucher, a deposit for the base level one. And that came about because the person who gave us that as a present, she came on holiday and every time we were, we were out riding with her or skiing with her, she'd skied forever. She was about 65, really good skier. She'd sort of be at the top of this run and, and, and I'd go, ah, oh, so I'm just going to meet you at the bottom. I'm just going to hike along that bit and meet you at the bottom and ride down there. And she'd look up and go, you're going to kill yourself. <laughs> Oh, then we'd go on this other run. I'm like, I'm just going to jump off that and spin off that and, you know, have a little jib there and, and so on. And she was just like, you're going to kill yourself. So she left and decided to to buy me a deposit on a Basie course for a Christmas present. And I'm like, I don't want to be a teacher. That's the worst job in the world. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so anyway, the next, uh, I didn't do it, didn't take it. Uh, did another season just riding, having fun. And then the next year went on the base level one course just purely from the perspective of becoming a better rider because I was so de dedicated and focused on riding and I rode with skiers as well at that time because there was, wasn't many snowboarders around and these skiers were all working towards their bases. They were into all these symmetrical turns and so they're doing all these symmetrical turns and I'd follow them and then I'd like go off and slash something and then come back in. And at some point they were like, Renelle, focus. If you're going to do your baby, <laughs> focus. <laughs> um, so that was really the start of my journey on um, the basis system. I didn't really do many trips. I, I went through seasons uh, more so than trips. And so when I finished my, it was quite funny, when I did my baby level one at the end of it, my trainer offered me a job in Andorra. He was head of the ski school in Andorra. And I said, oh, thanks, but I'm not going to be a teacher. Don't like it. Not into it. Don't want to wait for people all day. I just want to go riding. And uh, once I got this knowledge from that first course and I went out and started riding, these cogs had started turning and I began becoming a little bit obsessed with technical focus and drive and performance. And, and then suddenly um, I remember thinking, Hmm, maybe I will do that level two. Maybe I will sort of give it a go. And uh, again, another Christmas present, deposit on the level two. And I was thinking, you know, you open them, you're like, oh, that's not what I really want. But anyway, <laughs> thanks for that. And uh, so I did the level two again. And my trainer said, you know, Renal, you really need to be an instructor. Uh, and, um, you know, he sort of set loads of different tasks for me than the rest of the group by sort of, midway second week that was Neil McNabb by the way oh, no. when he was a trainer <laughs> yeah and uh he set loads of different tasks for me by the end of the week and uh he said Renell you know it's you really need to be a trainer and so I called the guy first level trainer and said you know I want a job and uh he said sure so I turned up in Andorra and when I turned up he says oh sorry I haven't got a job for you and I was like Oh, great. <laughs> but he said, if you want to just show up and pick up some work, you can, you, you know, you might have some. And I said, do I get a lift pass? And he's like, yeah, sure, you can have a lift pass. So it's beauty. I'll do that. So I rode around for a couple of weeks, rising around everywhere, loving it. And uh, one day on a Friday afternoon, that was a huge team of instructors there. We had 23 instructors on that snowboard team alone, and there was over a couple of hundred skiers. It was huge. Which uh, really which place? School. And this was in Andorra. That was Soldado El Sater, and it was so wonderful there. I absolutely loved it. But uh, yeah, so it was a really big school, and one it was a Friday afternoon, and all the rest of the crew just wanted to go out drinking. And this late one hour private came in, and uh, the, no one wanted the lesson, so I was like, I'll take it. So it was my first lesson. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> it had been a while <laughs> since I'd done my level two the year before. And I was like, oh, what am I going to teach this guy? And it was quite cool. He sort of turned up and just cruised around and said, oh, I want to learn to ride the trees. So I was like, sweet. I thought, great, let's just go cruise around the trees for a while. And uh, he was actually, he, he loved smoking weed, this guy. And he said, I just want to smoke some weed in the trees. And I'm like, you know, I'm really, really frightened because I'm in another country and I was like, I don't really know what to say to that. It's my first hour on the job. And I'm not really sure what to do. But anyway, this guy had, um, I taught him loads, how to ride through the trees and, you know, we giggled and laughed a lot and worked on a few things. And he went straight back in the ski school and booked me for six weeks straight. Oh, wow. That's sick. Private <laughs> lesson. Yeah, straight after the lesson. So turned out at the end of that season I had the most request privates in all of the ski school um and that guy is actually now base level one oh, as well wow. so he went through yeah he went through the system as well so thanks to him really I'm an, I'm an instructor because I kind of thought you know this job's not so bad <laughs> first six weeks was awesome <laughs> and how was that uh, progression within those kind of six weeks um of course with the with the client himself and just you kind of experiencing um that ev evolution of teaching mm. it was awesome actually 
he was your typical ride and get around the mountain, uh, didn't really know or understand any technique behind what he was doing, wanted to learn and improve, um, but also, also just right into detail, I, I suppose. And, and it was great for me there because when he first was out riding, he made all the obvious mistakes um, where he would lose a lot of grip, couldn't really control his speed very well, um, struggled with consistency, struggled with differences in change of terrain, different types of snow conditions, wasn't able to adjust to different types of turns for different types of terrain. You know, they were all the obvious mistakes. And what I found awesome there was from my teaching experience was at, every day at lunchtime, I come in and in Andorra at the time we had, gosh, in that group of 13, I think there was four current Basie trainers. There was Mark Seller, Paul um, Coleman, who's now, who started um, Cap 9 snowboarding at Mirabel, um, Dan Burton, who's Kiwi trainer. Uh, there was a real depth of knowledge at that table. You know, Neil McNair had been working there for a couple of years. Um, yeah, so every day I'd come in at lunchtime and I'd go, this is happening. I don't know what to do. What do you suggest? And I'd get the whole table and, you know, give me some information on what, what I'd do. And so that was just awesome. For many years, we just had the great, a great friendship around that table and the depth of knowledge that was passed around in those lunch hours, just invaluable to learn. He, in that six week period, he was, he was such a good rider in the end. Uh, and he went from being like your typical sort of holiday maker yeah. to being one of the crew, you know, <laughs> not even one of the crew, you know, all the instructors would come out for a run and he'd come along for a run. And, you know, we, that was such a good place. We had little Tyler Chalson who lived there yeah. at the time and he'd be knocking on the door saying, can someone ride with me? Cause he wasn't allowed to ride on his own cause he was too young. And yeah, it was a good, good place to learn. Yeah. Ben Kinnear as well. Who's the current GB freestyle coach. He did his um, uh, gap course there at the time. I sort of mentored him and took him under my wing and you know, helped him through. He'd knock on the door and the other instructors would go, instructors no. only. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to take his bag for him. <laughs> but yeah, it's, I can't stress enough how important it is to work with other peers who have had experience. So that was really my training ground for, for teaching. Yeah, awesome. it's I definitely kind of can relate to that in the sense of go kind of either going away or when like you do get um some external kind of people come to the snow domes who are high level instructors and you know you, you kind of really start talking to them and then they give you like little exercises to do and it just makes you think about something completely different that you wouldn't tend to like think about and it's mm. so it's so mind blowing and so refreshing to get that that it just motivates you even more um yeah. with that every bit and it, yeah i i really love that um just being able to kind of have people around me who you could just like learn from and just like divulge all this information just suck it all in essentially <laughs> definitely absolutely um yeah mm. let's do definitely move on to those higher qualifications so when did you kind of really start focusing on um when you wanted to kind of move up in the Bayesian system and kind of go from mm. there mm. So I've always really been dedicated to precision. Even when I was doing seasons in Maribel, I was just so obsessed with geeking out in tech, really. And I, and I think I had a perfect experience in Andorra because the team that I worked with, there weren't only trainers, but um, there were also other instructors who came in at the same time as I had. And we had a group there and we stuck together for each of the Basie level three modules. So we did the tech, the teach, the off, the mountain, mountain safety, the common theory. We did all the courses together, which had it, its pros and cons, but really it was in Andorra. And I guess we had those role models there who were Basie trainers. And that was back in the day when Basie was big in Andorra. So I never thought I'd become a Basie trainer and I never really thought I'd do level three either. It was just that everyone else was thinking about it. We all trained together and laughed about it. And oh God, it was, gosh, it was so fun there. Like 
we do little styling courses for the students on a Friday afternoon and we were all so competitive and someone would go, like one of the other tr instructors would go, I'm going to race you, let's do it in nice. switch. And then another one would go, I'm going to race you, let's do it one-footed. And then I'm going to race you, let's do it switch one-footed down the, down the slalom course while people are filming. And, <laughs> no, that was just all part of it. We, we'd, like, set out this box just out the front and we had one of these old-school rails and, you know, we were sort of learning Cap 27 Islands while we were waiting for, for clients to come and it was it was a really good experience. So coming on to level three just was a natural progression. It was it was just part of it. It was just where we were all moving together and training together and there was always someone to go out and work with. Um, so, yeah, it was – didn't mean it was easier. The courses were really hard. <laughs> I remember always doing really well on the courses uh, but just being really nervous and stressed and um, frightened, uh, mainly – mainly because I didn't know what to expect and I didn't know if I was prepared enough. Uh, and, yeah, just not really sure whether whether you're going to make it through and, until the very end. And um, there's something about those courses, isn't it, where you really put a lot of pressure on yourself to perform and do it well and you want to be the best you can be. Uh, but I've so come to learn that progression is important. Perfection isn't everything. And practice isn't about progression or perfection. Practice is about failure. And being good is about failure. Learning and growing is all about learning and growing from your mistakes. So I was pretty hard on myself back then and I didn't like to fail. But now I know that with my students, I'm looking for those moments where they fail. I want them to fail. I they, they don't like that, but I'm, I'm always <laughs> yeah. teaching that mis mistakes are a pathway to excellence. Failure's it, you know. Failure's where it's at. That's that's where we get the most information from to improve and grow and develop. And it's just our perception of it that um, scares everybody really. And it's just that we're so hard on ourselves. But if we can change that and flip that, we can just really get so much better, so much faster. So, yeah, sorry, bring him back to level three. Sorry, I'm going on there. <laughs> it's all right. Bring don't worry back about to it. level three. Just seem like a natural progression. Just seem like a natural way to go. Mm. And then pff, trainer. And then the, how was the, the training exam? Which did you find a bit more difficult? Did you find the theory uh, or the teaching or what did you find difficult in terms of the criteria itself? Or did you find just overall just a nervous kind of? Yeah. <laughs> nervous wreck the yeah. entire yeah. time. <laughs> Do you know that again? It's a good question. Uh, so on my three take and teach, I was I was pretty good, you know. Um, what I found most difficult was the group dynamics because even though I knew these guys really well, there was I was always the only woman and there's always a thing, you know, unfortunately, with guys and girls when they get together, some guys I'm really happy with women being at that higher level. So there's always, at some point, someone's trying to stitch you up. Someone's trying to dig it in. Someone's trying to make it more difficult for you because I found it quite easy. easy. But that wasn't because, you know, I was mummy or anything. It was just that I trained so hard. By this time, you know, I've been snowboarding for, for eight seasons, you know, so I did really well. Uh, and... Uh, Going on to the trainer selection, I was the first woman to go through that whole one-week trainer selection process in the history of Basie. And we turned up and uh, sort of, I think there was, I can't remember if there was five or six on the course, I can't remember. But I remember turning up and there was this, one of the other guys there who um, who's still teaching. And uh, he we looked across and there was one of the other, one of our peers, Turning up with his snowboard bag, he's got this real cool swag. He goes walking up, and everyone goes, "Oh no, that's blah blah blah." He's totally cool as a cucumber, that guy. And I remember looking across, going, "God, I'm never going to get this." <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that was so funny. And uh, when you talk about nerves, <clears throat> I remember sort of three days into it, this guy who's like totally known as being cool as a cucumber. <laughs> We're at breakfast, and I'm like, "Hey, cocoa mate," he's like. God, I've had diarrhea for like the last 24 hours. I don't know if I'm going to make it through this week. I think I'm going to have a heart attack. I think I'm actually going to have a heart attack. It's the most stressful week of my life. <laughs> and um, he's still a trainer now, that one. We, we, we both got through and he's still a trainer now. But 
my first sort of teaching session on that trainer selection week was just insane. I remember standing up and there were two trainers there um, who were examining me and I stood up in front of all my peers and started chatting and uh, the head of Basie skis up to the back of the group and he pulls out this notebook out of his pocket, sorry, he flips it open, he's got the pen and he just looks at me all big smile on his face and I just totally froze. Oh. <laughs> I was like, oh no, oh, <laughs> how am I going to do this? I totally froze and I had to just go, you know, time out. I, I, I can't do this. So I had to, like, I had to mess it up. That was one of one, one big failure really there. And then I, I spoke to him on the left. I said that was just a, a lot of pressure. And I know that, you know, part of this job role is to be able to handle pressure. Um, yeah, but fortunately, you know, they, they gave us another go. And uh, that night we were even delivering all the lectures to the actual Beijing students. And it was it was a really tough week. We'd get our, our lesson plan sort of five minutes before the lesson. You'd have the lift to prepare what you were going to teach and develop. and yeah, it was it was great. You know, looking back, it was a real pivotal point. Yeah, I'm, my career. I'm guessing you were like over the moon sit when you kind of saw that qualification, like that that like yeah, you've passed, and <gasps> there was like such yeah. a relief off the shoulders. Or yeah, it didn't sink in. Hey, it really didn't sink in because it was it was kind of weird because there was a load of other snowboard trainers there at the time, and I'll, I'll never forget it. We're in Zermatt, and we were sort of invited to go for a drink with the current snowboard trainers. It was like a welcome to the team thing. And it was the first time a girl had been in the group, you know. And uh, I remember, I really remember feeling really welcome. And I really remember feeling like really unwelcome at the same time. It was a bit like, oh, how, how we, it was a real adjustment yeah. for the team, I think. And everyone was sort of finding their feet as to how they were going to adjust to that. Uh, and it took about it took about a year, or maybe no, maybe about three years before I really felt like I was on the team, you know, as part of the team. And yeah, it was huge. I was so happy. I was so excited, and um, I just knew it would open up a whole more, a lot more travel opportunities for me, which I, I love to travel. So. Yeah, it was huge. But what I didn't realise was I thought I was a really good teacher until then. <laughs> I didn't realise you were stepping into a new game altogether and it's an absolute honour to work alongside other disciplines to learn their ways of teaching as well because the depth of knowledge that they have in skiing and even in telemarking and the mountain safety guys and, and learning their approaches it's it's just awesome i absolutely love it yeah so yeah weight off the shoulders for a while <laughs> um yeah that's that's so cool in terms of yeah getting to that higher aspect of of being able to kind of get there and just saying yes i've did it it's it's the best thing in the world just having a little fist bump to yourself um yeah i kind of want to go into then um the idea of you um kind of diverging off and really focusing on the specialties. So when did you really start focusing on like your adaptive um, and all that kind of other subsequent kind of modules alongside that? Mm. That was a real natural progression, really. Like, as I said, I was a, you know, a personal trainer. I did that in Australia. In Australia. I also studied anatomy and physiology. So I was a professional massage therapist, sports oh, massage therapist. Nice. Yeah, I didn't practice for very long. I, I, I think I only practiced for about three weekends. So I went, no, I don't want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go out there and play the sport. I don't want to fix people doing this, doing it. And uh, so that was a real natural progression. I was always a tech geek, you know, and freestyle lover and freestyle fan. And, um, yeah, it just just seemed to fit, really. I think, I think how that came along was when I worked in those big schools with other guys, um, nobody really wanted those lessons. Nobody wanted the difficult, I don't want to say difficult cases because adaptive snowboarding's just the same as teaching snowboarding. At the end of the day, we're all problem solving. It's just with adaptive snowboarding, the problems are bigger. The bigger problems to solve. 
So nobody really wanted that. I think I suppose it was an easier way to, to, to make easier money. And, you know, I've done so many freestyle lessons and so many off-piece lessons and I've totally gone full circle with everything. And, and, I, and I guess it was a natural progression to go, actually, my heart is in introducing snowboarding and problem solving how we are going to help all these people love the mountains like I do and love this sport like I do. You know, I cry after every adaptive lesson. I know that sounds ridiculous, but every time I walk away from an adaptive lesson, it touches my heart so much. And and, uh, and I just cry because they have so much courage and tenacity to overcome the challenges really that they face and and it's a real puzzle i love i'm I'm just so many times scratch my head going how am i going to do this one (laughs) yeah so yeah it was a natural progression i think i've been a snowboard adaptive trainer and examiner now for five years maybe Mm. uh yeah and yeah i love it my heart's there my heart's totally there yeah it's brilliant so yeah i think let's go and talk about the um, just the adaptive industry in general um, mm-hmm. and how have you seen just specifically snowboard adaptive and how that's kind of progressed along with like the ski adaptive as well? Yeah, so I think that in Europe the facilities aren't as uh, set up as they are in the States and Canada or maybe even in Australia um, simply because of the terrain we have is more challenging, really, uh, and the conditions we have are more challenging. I think now with COVID and Brexit, instructors aren't going to be able to rely on the laurels of I've got a level two qualification now, I'm just going to go off and get a job. I, th- I think instructors are going to have to work harder. They're going to have to have second disciplines. They're going to have to have second languages. They're going to have to stand out a little more. Uh, and I think with the world changing and the consciousness changing a little, I, I'd like to believe that adaptive snowboarding will become more popular. You know, it's becoming already more popular. I've been working recently with the Armed Forces adaptive team. Uh, and, you know, there's nothing better than, than helping people enjoy snowboarding. This, they've got... Um, load of social media pages and I think it's just getting out there more in the social media. Team GB are highlighting it more now. It's becoming more of a cool, cool sport. And Swifty's one of the biggest ambassadors for that out there, what a legend. Uh, so I think it will improve. I think adaptive snowboarding will become more popular. People often ask me how much I do. And I have to say, I have at least at least one adaptive client per week. And and when I say one adaptive client per week, I'm talking three hours a day, five days, you know, or two hours a day for five days. Or, you know, sometimes I'll do that, you know, Team GB lot. Um, uh, I've worked with Andy a little bit. And, you know, sometimes it will be a lady, I've got a lady with multiple sclerosis. She comes back year after year, so no feeling in her legs. Little blind boy, 10 years old. Um, a lot of amputees. So I, I do quite a lot, but I think I think they more resonate to me. You know, I, I don't think adaptive instructors go out looking to become adaptive instructors. I think adaptive people resonate to instructors who have a lot of compassion, who are quite empathic, so they can feel other people's emotions and energy, who can read energy really well. Uh, yeah, I, I think adaptive clients find adaptive instructors actually, and it's a nice pathway. Yeah. Um, and where do you think the future of, uh, kind of adaptive snowboarding in general is kind of going to go ahead? Um, and ha- hopefully how do you see it kind of growing by itself? That's a tough one. Yeah, it's a pretty tricky one. (laughs) That's a tough one. It will grow. And I think with it in the Olympics, like I say, and more social media, I mean, it's always a push. It will grow, but I think it's going to take time. I I, I truly believe that instructors are going to recognise that they need to have 
a more rounded qualification to get uh, their licenses, uh, sorry, to get instructors to, uh, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> They'll need a more rounded qualification to get the schools to employ them because now with breakfast, Brexit, breakfast, getting tired, yeah. now with breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> we'll cut it out, don't worry. <laughs> uh, what I'm trying to say is now with Brexit, schools are going to have to sponsor instructors to get government visas to work for them. So instructors are going to have to have a bit more of a X factor, a bit more of a wow to get in. We need equipment in different places for people to be able to deliver uh, adaptive skiing lessons. But as you know, from our adaptive snowboarding, we don't really need that much equipment. So I'm hoping that gets a bit better. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm hoping more snowboard instructors get involved and advertise it more. Uh, there's some awesome people out there who really need our help. You know, I've just I've got a great story about one guy who's on the uh, our forces team where there's so much that needs to happen for in, in order for him to snowboard. So he's an above knee amputee and he had a certain snowboard leg with a hinge in the knee and a hinge in the ankle joint. And he had to actually, they had to get NATO involved to get that leg into this into the UK. There's this whole story about it because in the UK, they hadn't seen that leg before. They didn't have a patent on it. They weren't going to let him have the leg. So he wasn't even allowed to snowboard. Well, he couldn't snowboard without that leg because there was no other leg that he could have a hinge on both the knee and the ankle joint. Uh, but it was, it's a huge process still where... We're still working on developing, developing the equipment, still working on how to attach a feet to a snowboard, for, for example. Yeah, it's a, it's a long, we've got a long way to go. Yeah, I'll definitely want to, when we do get Swifty on, I definitely want to kind of talk to him about his specifically made bindings and um, mm. and all that technology. And uh, of course, just be, be really interesting just to kind of talk about that, the idea of the tech that's involved. Yeah, and it is just super interesting as well, you know. It's quite it's quite mad how probably, what, five years ago we would say just get in a sit ski and then that's it, where it's kind of come yeah. such a long way where it's like, yeah, you can snowboard, you're, you're, you're allowed to do this, it's, you, you know. Yeah. You, you can have fun doing it. <laughs> you can have a great time. Yeah. <laughs> so when we, did that, when we did that course, right, do you remember we set up a um, progression for a double amputee to go through the central theme. Do you yeah. remember? So yeah, I remember did that. that. That whole sort of hour, two-hour session. So he was like, no, that doesn't work. Okay, let's make this. Let's do that. And, and we wrote a new progression on how to get a double amputee from a beginner to making turns. So so that, yeah, there's so far, there's so far to go. We've got so far to go. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a good future in it. Um, I think that once it's advertised more and once people get out there and, highlight it this is, this is another problem with snowboarding and industry in general I, I believe is that coverage only usually gets shared around with what's cool and I know that because I've had such a rounded career in snowboarding you know I've I've done the girls freestyle slope style events um you know i was the first one in in team to start those i've done the female season air sessions you know i've worked for the big schools i started a big snowboard school um first one in france actually when we had six basic trainers working there uh we had sort of neil mcnair he co-founded it with neil mcnair who, who we all know is mcnair, mcnair snow sports ben kinnia worked for me who's now gb freestyle coach we had Joel Gray, who's now the top um, UK surf coach. Uh, Kev Edwards, UK Basie, as we all know, product manager. Dan Burton. You know, we had a really amazing team there. And the coverage that you get when you hit cool mm. is completely different to the level of coverage that you get for something that's not in mainstream. And that's a real shame because the integrity behind teaching adaptive snowboarding is so much more valuable um, 
then it got a bunch of trainers getting together, starting up a snowboard school. And, you know, we had so many firsts there in that, you know, we were the first, you know, school in Europe that was a specific snowboard school. I mean, we had, I was in the ESF office in the police station at least twice a week <laughs> reporting an abusive situation where we were being abused for working in France. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, I'm going completely off track there. <laughs> it's <but all> good. <laughs> unfortunately, I think what's going to happen with with um, adaptive, until the uncle comes into mainstream, and this is why people like Swifty is so important out there because he's just pushing it so much in the media, you know, until that gets recognised more and has more um, exposure in the media, then it's never really going to grow. People aren't going to know it's out there. People aren't going to know that they can come for a lesson. Then there's not going to be the demand for the instructors. They're not going to be the demand for the instructor courses. So, yeah, it's, it's really important, really, that the social media movement starts supporting the sort of more uncool sides like we're looking at now with the equality, mental health, um, you know, and, and adaptive. Mm. It's, you, you definitely kind of see, really see that kind of seeping in. Um, I I'm really seeing that with with Cassie at the moment in the way they are really kind of um, pushing a more of a, a professional style of riding with, of course, the addition of really kind of the focus on the free ride aspect, but the way you kind of perform under a board is then just kind of the standard um, stereotypical snowman we kind of usually see um, today, which is really interesting. Um, I really want to move on to fresh snowboarding actually now. Um, kind of linking in with adaptive as it is anyway, and you're quite speciality, and that's kind of the USP as one, well, one of many USPs behind snowboard, uh, fresh snowboarding. But let's start off with the motivation of why you created fresh snowboarding and kind of where it became to be. Yeah, now the natural progression, actually, as you know, I co founded another school with all those trainers in team. Um, and Neil had a baby and um, had, you know, just had other um, interests. So, I naturally had a different style of teaching as well. So I'm a total tech geek, as you know, but also I've always had this holistic approach to performance. So I've always looked into other areas and brought them all together um, on piece to off piece and freestyle. I've always been interested in the body, the mind, and, you've, and uh, your board and how they all work together and how they connect to the mountain. And that's always been my um, philosophy and my, my natural way of teaching is that actual absolute connection to the self, connection to the mountain and connection to your board and how all those link together. So, you know, your mind muscle connection and, you know, your muscle to board connection. Uh, so fresh snowboarding came about really out of an opportunity. I was actually at that point in my career, I was going to give up snowboarding, um, teaching anyway. I was thinking about it because a few other things was going on in my personal life. And I, and I kind of got to December. I'll never forget it. It was December 1st. I was surfing down the West Coast, France. I, I, I'm surfing. I pass all, pass all my son is in the wave surfing. And uh, it was a brilliant, awesome sunset, barrels, gorgeous day. Got home and I went, it's really cold. I was like, what am I going to do? I'm not going to not go snowboarding. <laughs> <laughs> and then about a week, I wrote the website and thought, all right, that's it. I'm going snowboarding and went back out to teen. I thought, what do I want to do? It was a great reset for me. What do I want to focus on and what do I want to do? Because I'd always done this traditional group sessions, private sessions, um, where people came along for, you know, your 15 hours of groups and went into different various, so classic ski school style. And then I broke it down and went, actually, what do I love doing? And what am I? Who am I? And how do I want to bring that into my teaching? So that's where my whole body, mind, board, you know, concept came together, where I started delivering a focus on the rider. Uh, and rather than focus on performance of the rider itself, I focused on the performance of the board and focused on the connection of the board to the snow. And then we looked at the performance of the rider. Uh, and it was a holistic approach to, to everything. And so I'd already had all of my technical, real detail and precision of technical background because I've been teaching at such a high level for so many years. And I've done that across all the strands, you know, variable, 
piece to off piece freestyle you know freestyle was really my first sort of love and um so that that just seemed again another natural progression for me to go into the performance side backing up the technical detail that i'd already had and just starting to look at the whole full picture and also really looking at the mind because for me i have this firm belief that um people can't snowboard at all when you just go straight into a technique based session so every not every a lot of instructors go technique 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 let's just focus on technique let's do this drill let's make this happen blah 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 but actually until a person can actually center themselves and connect with themselves and be in a state of being they can't do they can't hear anything that you're saying because there's just that they're in a state of survival they can't receive information they can't feel what's going on under their feet they can't feel what their muscles are doing. They can't feel their body. They're in this state of, oh, I've got to try and do that. And oh, technique, technique, technique. It's, it's all about doing. So yeah, that whole fresh snowboarding philosophy of that body mind board approach came from one guy actually who I taught. Um, and that was about 10 years ago in that moment where I'm like, what am I going to do? I thought about this one guy and he was a miracle. And I, and I was always obsessed with this little miracle. And I was thinking to myself, how did that guy pick up so much so quick? He literally went from having never gone off a kicker before to spinning fives off a, off a blue kicker, landing in the sweet spot, both in switch and regular, back and front, never been on a kicker before in two, three hour sessions. So this guy really just, I was obsessed with trying to work out what he did and how he did it. And I used that as um, my guideline really for, for the mental approach as the importance of the mental approach. He was awesome. Wow. I love that. It's, that is, to be fair, that is completely mind blowing to me. Like how, yeah. So can you go, kind of go into detail, like what you figured out with, with that guy specifically on how his mind worked in that way? Um, yeah, I'm quite interested in that. Yeah, sure. He was, he was great. Uh, he'd just come back from Afghanistan and he was, he was clearly in a, in a lot of, um, emotional trauma from his experience there. And he knew he was going away again very soon. So first of all, he, he had free will. So his ego had gone out of it. He had just the will and the love and the want and the drive to make the most and live in that present moment. You know, he was not thinking about that past. He was not thinking about that future. He was with me there and then focused a hundred percent. And, and I think free will is really important when a person really has that will. It's, that's when the miracles can happen, when you cannot think about all these old past experiences because they are what build fear. And uh, he, I had 100% absolute in everybody, uh, belief in him as I do in everybody. I believe everyone can do everything to the highest level. It's just this that stops us by 80% and then the body by 20% and then the technique comes after that. But uh, first of all, he was strong. And he was fit, so he didn't have the physical to worry about. Um, his technical level was reasonable as a rider already. He'd never been in the park before. He just wanted to learn that skill. We had quite a lot of psychological and emotional situations to deal with there, although I didn't highlight it as that. I firstly recognised what type of learner he was, so how his brain processed information. Uh, and we call that visual VAC, the AK. Um, and a lot of people poo poo that, but I don't see it as a learning style. I see that as how a computer brain processes and stores information in our brain. So I'd established quite quickly this guy was a visual and he didn't like that many words. And he was also kinesthetic. And so what I did with him was every single run, I demoed, he just watched me copied. 
And I tried to close his eyes and we talked through what that's going to feel like. And I'll never forget, actually, when we started doing the grabs and the spins, we were literally laying on our backs at the top of the kickers, you know, and we had like a, I'm going to, I've got my socks on here, so you're going to see the socks. <laughs> so good. Like, we were like, yeah, we had it, we were laying, in the, laying on our backs and we are like, I was practicing all the grabs, like there's, you know, where, where, where to grab on your board. And, uh, and I was just making him close his eyes and feel each one and feel each place before we went off the kickers. So basically he just watched me. We'd, we'd talk it through first very, very briefly. He'd watch me. He'd feel the feel where it was he had to grab or feel where it was he had to do. We always did a static of it first. I'd do the moving demo and then he'd follow me through. And every time he just did it, every single time, every single thing I did, he did it. I've never seen anything like it before ever and I'll never forget he was just so unique. But I think what made him so different was he was a good student because he's used to learning. He was used to taking instructions, so he didn't have that whole, like, um, judgment on himself. So he didn't constantly put himself down or judge or, or uh, go through the normal mental procedures that most people would play out as they go through a normal learning environment. You know, he was just so open to learn, and, and he had the will, free will and no judgment. And, and, and I, I can't stress enough how important that is for, for the miracles, you know. Uh, yeah that's that is that's mental to be fair i really love that um and i quite like the idea the technique of just kind of lying on your back and really feeling it <laughs> that's so cool um uh, yeah i never really thought about it in that way um i'm probably gonna have to try that when i get back to the snow day and everyone's just gonna see me lying on the back <laughs> having a feel for like everyone's gonna be like, what are you doing Max? uh yeah i let's move on to um teens itself as a resort and why yeah. you chose teens um as a resort to kind of base yourself out of? That's a funny story, actually. Well, we knew we wanted to leave Andorra because actually it didn't want to, we didn't want to work for ski school anymore. And that came about because we seriously couldn't handle all of the felt oppressive. One, we hated the uniforms and we wanted to make our own. We just was like, that's it. We've got to just get our own uniforms, which are cool. Cause we had these shoulder pads and all sorts, baggy, like really dodgy pads and stuff. And as you know, we co-founded a company there with Neil McNair and his girlfriend worked in team. So he visited team a few times. We knew we wanted to go somewhere where there was a high altitude, where the <clears throat> snow conditions were guaranteed uh, and where there was a big snowball community. And, you know, at the time when we first went to team, I remember we used to, we used to ride in the park all the time and I still do, but um, you know, back then, yeah, there was, and there was a bit of a snowboard community, not like there is now, but you know, I, myself and another, another British girl and another French girl, we were the only chicks in the park ever. Um, so team came about really because it had a good park back then. Um, and that was in 2006. So we, we had a great park, had good snow and also the long seasons and the ability to work long seasons. I'm currently working from October to May really, uh, and doing some summer stuff indoors as well, as you know, like instructor training uh, there. So it seems a great, um, yeah, it's a great resort in team because everything's instantly accessible from Team Lalak. I can immediately access a beginner slope, a blue run, a red run, a black run, uh, off-piste sections, um, sort of the backsides of two different valleys so we can follow the prevailing winds and, and move with the weather conditions and get down to tree areas. So actually in terms of terrain, really, it's it's really second to none there. So that, 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 were, that were a lot of the main factors as to, as to why I went there in the first place. And for me, you know, I, at that time, I could have had a beginner lesson in the morning and then a private instructor training the course in the afternoon so you know it was great to have all that access to everything that you need and gnarly off piece as well great um great great back country and last question especially with fresh snowboarding future of it like where do you see it kind of being in the next five years and any kind of plans or ideas that you can tell us of course um yeah where you kind of want it to go yeah so 
I guess, <clears throat> I guess um, rounding off sort of my experiences that I've had as a instructor, I, I feel like, you know, I've totally gone full circle. You know, I've done it all. I've taught every lesson of every level um, through off-piste, on-piste, freestyle. Uh, I've done every age, <laughs> age. I've gone from beginners to top level instructor training. I've done, like I say, all those girls courses, girl sessions. I've been a speaker for, you know, um, been a speaker for quality and diversity in the industry. So I've done it. I've done it all. I've been with big schools, small schools, um, started my own school. Uh, now I've gone full circle, come back to this independent sort of writing. And, and what I, I really follow what I love in my heart. So for me, I'll still continue to develop, develop people with private clients um, and I'll still continue to do instructor training. <clears throat> Pardon me, sorry. Uh, one of the things I do are uh, sort of bespoke VIP groups. So that will be like a crew get together and we'll go off to Japan or, or something. So that will continue. As for what, uh, what the future is for me, it might be slightly different for other people because I'm putting on all those hats that I've worn in over the years and bringing it all together. I'm, d I'm at the moment preparing some online instructor training courses for, you might want to go for that, it's level two, but level two prep and a level three prep. One of the things that Bayesi never teach you and people don't realise with Bayesi is that there's three parts to a Bayesi course. There's the tech, the teach and the theory. So people don't really see that evening lecture as a part of it, but you know, it's equally as important. So I'm moving online to prepare instructors who really want the wow factor, you know, who want the X factor, who want mastery, uh, who really want to take on snowboarding as a career, uh, not just have it as a part-time job. I want to help those people because what I notice a lot and I see it a lot uh, is what I call unsafe teaching environments. So either there's been wrong terrain choice or the wrong progression for that level rider, uh, or the way that the person's being taught. I just watched a, a tutorial the other day and I was so amazed because one of the first things that happened on that tutorial was this student was pretty much belittled for doing it wrong. And then the instructor was like, oh, so I'm going to do it right. And this is how you do it. And so, yeah, I want to teach instructors how to communicate in a different way, how to communicate by elevating consistently, how to have all of the tools and formulas behind them with a detailed, in-depth technical knowledge and understanding to be able to construct progression using actual formulas and having backgrounds and things in their pocket that they can pull out when they need it. Just to create one, safe environments for instructors and two, safe instructor environments for the students so that the students just come back stoked on snowboarding and, and love it. So there's less, less accidents out there and uh, more people into it. So online work, going to be doing that for me. Uh, I'll definitely continue uh, instructor training and development, go down that equality line, I'll help out with that, do as much adaptive work as I can in the future as well. But really, uh, most of my work is with private clients, bespoke VIP crew and uh, instructor training and development. And I work mainly with precision, uh, detail and real in-depth technical development at, at a high level. Mm. Oh, yeah. I, I quite like the idea and it's quite cool seeing um, a lot of like ski schools and companies really kind of going onto the online now, especially with how COVID is um, and the world, yeah. the world we're in. And it, it's definitely really interesting seeing um, a lot of um, kind of companies doing that. Um, not There's not really a lot in snowboarding though. You see a lot of um, ski schools kind of give online training. Um, 
most notably I kind of see Ski Focus do that quite a lot. Um, mm. And then, of course, we have um, one of our sponsors is Watch and Ride, and they're a Canadian association, which not really kind of focus on um, the idea of just um, standard kind of tutorials and whatnot, but not nothing really focusing on trainers and instructors themselves, which you don't see mm. anywhere else, which is really cool to see, actually. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm definitely going for that. Um, also, what I find that I don't use, there's just so much conflicting information out there as well. <laughs> Sometimes I look at it, I'm like, that's good. Oh, no, that's dodgy. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And then I'm like, oh, no, that's really, really <laughs> confusing. And I'm confused. So surely, you know, students are going to be confused through that. And yeah. there's so much conflicting information. So really uh, sifting through from that and finding structure and strategy in order. Yeah. Um, and, and also, I, yeah, I just want to want to bridge the gap for instructors because I feel that these days most instructors just want to get to the next level without actually spending a lot of time getting that teaching experience and that mastery and that expertise of all the knowledge that you've had from making those mistakes. And there's a lot to learn to bridge the gap. I mean, even learning to analyse from a biomechanical point of view, uh, it takes a long time for people to learn to see the, the small intricate inconsistencies and how that affects performance. Uh, as, aside from that, also learning the in-depth theory for every single type of turn. I mean, we've got so many different turns out there and, you know, so many different tasks and um, there's so many different formulas of how to achieve those tasks. And, I, and, and yeah, it's just not quite clear out there. So I'm working on that. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah it's it's it's. Cool. So cool. I, I want to move on to um, actually linking the technical abilities now. I'm kind of moving on to the tech next topic of that. Um, this yeah. is where I really kind of want you to take the stage and just, um, you know, really geek out yourself for now um, for, for, for all the viewers that are kind of um, watching. Um, first question, though, because um, I've heard you say it um, so, um, a couple of times, counter foot pedaling. Yeah, um, not a lot of people know about it. Um, you know, it's quite it's quite its own niche little thing. But um, to anyone kind of listening, I want you to explain what it is and how, what's the goal it achieves. Okay, and why we do it. Yeah. <clears throat> so really, every, everything's outcome based. So first question is, do you want to increase speed? Do you want to decrease speed? Do you want to maintain speed? So we all know that we've got skid grip or carve yeah so skid and grip would be where we would either maintain or decrease speed yeah so really the counter foot pedaling comes in when we want to to achieve grip the more grip you want to achieve the more counter foot pedaling you need yeah so imagine skid where the tail end of the board skids out, then there's less counter foot pedaling at that point because you have less edge angle on the back foot. So the back foot will lose height. The back end of the board will skid as it goes down the hill. The more grip you want to achieve, then it's important to use that counter pedaling on the back foot because as you increase that counter foot back pedal, you're going to achieve grip as you go through the turn so that the board maintains height and maintains speed control and maintains control throughout the turn. Counter foot pedaling is such a big sort of story and, um, you know, essentially everybody does pull on that back foot pedal when they come into a turn anyway, we have to. But what people don't recognise is how to play with it when you get on. You know, we have to get onto our back foot pedal, but then how to play with it. So why would you play with it? What outcome do we achieve by having it? And how does it help? I suppose the questions you want to, you want to answer there. <laughs> <Don't you? laughs> so one, it's for grip. Uh, two, it's to improve your level of performance. And three, it's for turn setup. And for the initiation for the turn set up for the next turn. So when we use it, for those of you who have never heard of it before, um, counter foot pedaling is where we use the back foot pedal. 
Uh, what we generally tend to do, or what I do a lot in every single turn, if I'm trying to decrease or, or maintain my speed, is increase the edge angle on the back foot to create a bit of a counter foot pedal. That creates a solid platform for me to actually maintain my consistent balance and core structure. So I'm really connected to the snow and I can really feel my back foot connected. Now imagine if I'm going to flatten that back foot pedal and if the board starts to skid out, I'm not really going to feel that stable on the board, am I? You know, you, when you've got that back foot pedal engaged, you've got this platform you can stand on, you've got this stability, you've got this position we can move from and we're pretty comfortable. So going back to sort of grip and that turn set up and the initiation point. So we can either use that pedal just to maintain grip or we can use that pedal and play with the degree of the edge angle to increase performance. What it does essentially is it sets up a platform for us to lean on um, or for us to use in a balanced way so that the, we can then introduce strong fore pedal and strong fore movement to initiate into the next turn. So you can imagine if that board's got a lower foot pedal and it's getting out, it's going to be much harder to lean forward and much harder to get that front foot engaged in the snow. So really it's about connection. It's about grip and drive. So firstly, if you think of it with grip, as you increase the back foot pedal, the tail of the board is connecting to the snow. It gives you a strong platform to move forward onto the front foot. And then on the front foot, as you pedal into the turn, the contact point is going to get nice early grip on the nose of the board as it turns into the, drops into the turn. And you're going to be balanced over the edge because you're already you know, in that position and strong and centered and you've got good core engaged. So if it's just grip, that's what we use it for. When it comes to performance, that's when we start cranking it and playing with it and dropping off and picking up and, you know, there's a better counter pedal always in every turn. I mean, even in carve, you know, top end high speed carve, you know, we're definitely playing with a little bit of counter pedal even in that as well. So it depends on the performance level. If we're going for standard sort of performance, then we're using a little bit of counter pedal. If we're going for high performance, that's when you're cranking it up and you're just really adjusting it according to the terrain that's under you and according to the amount of ping you want to get out of your riding really and how much flair you want ah thanks for that that was actually really <laughs> interesting and, and really um yeah i've definitely learned a, a couple of other things from from that to be fair um yeah kind of linking into that um speaking about how you ride um yeah definitely talk like let's say three things on um what you kind of use and what you think about when riding um on ways to kind of turn a snowboard um, that you don't necessarily see from, like, other people? Mm. I don't really think about my own riding anymore. I mean, I can – I've just been teaching for so long and riding for switch for so long and, you know, I'm doing about eight 900 hours a season. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> so much time doing all different things and so many different yeah. tasks. Don't really think about my riding. But what I do notice is if I'm recovering from injury, if I'm tired – um, beginning of the season, if I do think about my riding, it's always that Achilles heel. Was, everyone's always got one. Yeah. Don't think you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> You've all got one yeah, out definitely. there. Everyone's going to have a bit of a weak spot. Um, so I always, first of all, focus at that point to make sure my body's strong, to make sure that I'm working out at home, to make sure that I've got that, you know, good proprioception happening, that I'm fed well, that I'm sleeping well, um, that I've got the right nutrition for the day. That takes That's a whole other story in itself, by the way, of how to keep yourself energised and fueled throughout the day and warm and comfortable and what to wear and all that. Um, but usually I find the times when my riding, I have to think about it, it's another factor that's bringing it in. So I'll be slightly weaker as a, a recovery from injury. It yeah. won't be because of the, the snow conditions or, or anything. Cause I'm just so used to riding and everything in bumps and deep snow and no visibility and heck I've even been, um, <laughs> I've even volunteered as a um, rescue victim 
for the French Pistas to rescue me <laughs> with the avalanche dogs and I've been pulled out of two metres of snow <laughs> five times in one day, you know. So, so, so going back to what's my Achilles heel and what I think about when I'm writing, I spent so much time perfecting my writing that it's so autonomous to me now. But in those times when I'm a bit tired, there's always that heel side edge for me. Um, I've broken a lot of my left hand side. So broke my left ankle, broke my left heel, broke my left knee cap and tip and fib and shoulder and ribs. And so heel side initiation, I'm always stronger at a lower range of movement. Um, so most guys are stronger at a higher range. That's why you see women riding at a lower range. It just got to do with our hip rotation and where our hips fit. Uh, and I find that when I'm injured, I don't have that lower range of flexibility as much as I normally do or when I've been recovering from injury. So when that kicks in, when I'm riding, I'm always focusing on my heel side initiation, you know, just to be softer in my lateral connection to leg length of my front and back leg leg length, so flexion and extension and pressure control and managing pressure in conjunction with my lateral movement. Um, because I tend to, I used to quite a lot when I, in my earlier years, I used to sort of dump back and break the waist a little bit on my heels. And that was literally because I was recovering from so many injuries over the years. So when I, when I think about my riding, really I'm thinking about actually how I worshipped my body <laughs> enough to be doing what I'm doing now, you know, and um, am I in the right place and the right terrain for my fitness level that I have at the moment, you know, and, um, you know, for my from a mental mental state right now, am I tired, you know? And, and I always honor my body, always listen to my body. You know, I've turned back. I've turned back from, you know, a half day split board tour. And instead of dropping in the cool, I've turned back and come home. So, yeah. It's de yeah, sef definitely sensibility there as well, for sure. Um, mm. Yeah, I kind of want to focus on as well. Um, let's say what you kind of see the most in terms of people riding um, from like last season, how like is in terms of a common problem you see like a lot of people technically riding lately and how can that be fixed? We're talking instructors or riders? Both. Well, you okay. know, what, let's go instructors because it is the instructor podcast. <laughs> okay. Okay, so one of the biggest problems I find with instructors as they go through the levels, a lot of it, a lot of instructors tend to follow trends rather than getting the right fit for their body. So like I say, you know, I've seen it all go full circle. So I've seen narrow stances be cool and wider stances be cool and then narrow stances come back and wider stances come back and and I think a lot of people follow a trend rather than actually go, my leg length, this length, I'm strong at a lower range of movement or a higher range of movement. My body biomechanically and anatomically moves this way. So I'm going to work with my own strengths. I sort of watch everyone else and go, I want that and grab little bits from everybody rather than go within. And that's why I'm all about that being rather than doing. So if I think about the most common fault that people have, I would say is grip on heels at the end of the turn. That's a really common one. Uh, we work a lot on that. And the basic setup. So that all comes down to the, sometimes it's the order of the movement patterns. So they might have all the right movements in place, but they might slightly be in the wrong order to achieve that task. So they might have the ingredients there but they might have the wrong order of those ingredients. So the other thing would be, say, for example, you've got an instructor working on variables, steeps, and they're going for the high level course, and they're often losing grip at the end of the heel side. That's a real common one, or toe side turn initiation, which sort of go hand in hand, right, anyway. Um, and I forgot where I was going there. 
<laughs> uh, so that the, the heel side, yeah, losing grip on the heel side. So I was talking about sort of perhaps they've got the ingredients, but they're not in the right order, or they don't understand performance level. So when we think about a level of performance, we have to look at the timing and the intensity of the movements. So we call that rate and range. So every single movement that you make on your snowboard is a rate and a range. We're moving to a degree and we're moving at a different time of those degrees. So for the outcome they're looking for or the performance level that they're looking for, if they're after high performance, they might be going straight into sort of faster rate and range with, with more performance, but too quick for the level. Most people try and do everything real fast, real quick, real hard. <laughs> and it's actually, if you want to get great at something, it's the opposite. And I find this a lot with male instructors. I taught a guy who was like British judo champion and was a um, coach for everything. You know, he was a, a snowboard coach, a surf coach. He's awesome. I love him. Um, a kayak coach, just coached everything. And he used to do exactly that. He'd go in with too much force and too much power and too much strength because he's strong, man. He relied on that for so long and that got him through. And a lot of my coaching was about, hang on a minute, graceful performance and precision riding isn't about going in with high performance. It's about backing off, actually, feeling your body gracefully and then adding performance when you need it and, then, and and it's almost like you've got to turn off the tap and then turn on the tap slowly and practice everything slowly before you can turn the tap on really really fast you know and I think that's what I find most instructors do wrong when they're trying to train yeah definitely I've I've kind of been last well it's kind of like been my last year goal really bringing it back um, definitely what you were talking about and really just focus on just normal turns. Yeah. And really just focus on not going down really fast and just carving every single run. Um, yeah. um especially a lot. I've just been focusing. Okay. How, if I want to achieve, um, you know, this consistent arc through these turns, let's say shorts, um, I'm really going to do this. I'm going to really kind of focus on this. And it's, it's definitely, um, shown that, you know what basic and like really slow short turns or anything that's just slowed down is actually a lot harder than just going yeah. high performance a lot more. Um, so yeah. it's yeah. definitely really that idea of just kind of bringing it back to really kind of focus on the little bits to help ev evidently bringing those stronger bits a lot more into play and give you that real good foundation for sure. Absolutely. I call that small gains. Yeah. So we've got a long-term outcome, but really it's about whole part whole. So breaking down each outcome that you're looking for into its component parts and finding small gains in that and bringing that whole picture back together. So, yeah, and the other most underestimated thing is line, like you say, is control of line. Most people fail on one, they don't know enough of the theory, um, and so they can't put it into the practical writing or teaching. And two, it's online, they don't understand line. So line is the most underestimated, um, underestimated, technical difficulty for a snowboarder to understand and how to adjust that line for different types of snow and terrain. So like you said, shorts, you know, when, so shorts in itself, if we're sticking with one corridor and we've got lovely short closed turns, for people to understand that there's perhaps an adjustment in the camber or there's a, an adjustment in the pitch, when to adjust that one turn for that adjustment in the camber is pitch to maintain that consistent speed. That's a difficulty in itself for, for instructors to understand. So not only do we have to break it down to first get those ones right, then we've got to break it down to get it right for the differences in the adjustment for pitch and, um, and camber. And line is so underestimated, particularly the last third of the turn. So the lower third of the turn. We, I reckon I spend 90% of my life looking at that last third of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to get better, look at that. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I definitely see that. It's um, trying not uh, making sure you're actually closing them off more or, or you're seeing like, oh, do I, if I gripped it that, that, that much, you know, it's, it's, 
It's really quite interesting. I'm definitely doing a lot more where I'm just geeking out on just how my line looks now. And I'm like, really, everyone's just looking at me like, why are you looking at the snow very <laughs> enticingly, Max? I'm like, I'm trying to find my line where I've kind of been. <laughs> that right i can so resonate with that when i again going back to my indoor days one of my best friends was a guy called mark seller he was an old basic trainer not anymore he's now lives in australia but we used to get access to the mountain before the mountain had opened so we'd have a 45 minute window where the lifts were open just for instructors so we had this one run above the snowboard school and it was a steep red and every single morning uh, we'd go off on this wild sort of full-on mega fast car run but this one steep pitch we could see from the snowboard school so we'd sort of, you know, go off in this wild run everywhere else. But this last steep pit we dedicated to shorts and we'd do it in switch. We'd do it in regular. We'd do like different corridors, et cetera. But um, we could always see our lines because yeah. it was always past groomies. So we, we'd do our lines next to each other and, you know, we'd come back and sort of while we're waiting for our students, we'd look up and go, God, my third time I missed that last section yeah. and that, <laughs> was that initiation. And, you know, we'd chat to each other all the time. So, yeah, I totally resonate with geeking out on um, <laughs> on that. It's, it's really important, actually. A lot of people underestimate that. People see the cool riders who cruise around Mac 10, spin off this, slash that, you know, do all these flat land tricks and do all these crazy stuff. They don't actually realize the main foundations and the perfect foundations and the strong understanding of the fundamentals behind each one of those you know, small little shorts or mediums or um, long, long, well, we don't call them shorts, medium, long, zero in snowboarding. We call them um, small, medium, large, open door, closed turns. So, you know, people don't actually realize the importance of sticking to that symmetry and that structure uh, to develop the riding at a certain pace until you increase the performance level. I'm not saying to go out there and ride like that all the time because that'd be so boring, right? But it really is a part of snowboarding to improve as an instructor. Oh, great. Um, final question then. Um, we're yeah, just yeah. kind of wrapping up. Um, final thoughts. What's, in your opinion, makes a great snowboard instructor and what makes a good snowboard instructor right now? Ooh, so I guess I could probably bring that back to who would I employ? If I think of it that way, who would I employ and why would I employ them? So I'd be looking for the full package. I'd be looking for not so much the instructor who thinks is cool and if an instructor can do it all but thinks they're mega cool, they're like off my list straight away. I totally think what makes an amazing instructor is someone who has the full balanced approach to teaching and writing. So someone who takes pride in their profession, who's always professional, clothes are always clean, zips done up when they're teaching, um, you know, always presentable, always compassionate and considerate of the learner's needs and putting the learner's needs first before their own. So, for example, I'll deliver a base level one course sometimes and I will not even done one turn at my level until three or four days into the course where I'm like, I can't handle this anymore. I'm going to go and fly down the upstairs, down the mountain somewhere <laughs> and do something. But what I mean by that is pers an instructor who's, balanced enough in their own riding ability to be able to put themselves at the rider's level and put the rider's needs and the, the, the learner's needs first. That's huge, I think, as an instructor. Uh, so there's a certain level of conduct um, and there's a, there's a level of personable skills which are important. So communication skills gone to the days of those teaching through shame, blame, ridicule, you know, that encouraging, positive, supportive teaching. But I'm not saying just always be fluffing everything up because I don't agree with that at all either. I think it's really important to be real, you know, to be honest and not afraid to be honest and say, you know, actually, you need to work there and that, that you need quite a lot of work there. Uh, 
I think that's one of the biggest things when you become a trainer as opposed to being an instructor. Instructors always try and just fluff everything up. But when you become a trainer, you're like, no, no, keep going, no, oh, yeah. keep going, no, that's not right, keep going. So I love an instructor who's not afraid to do that. I love an instructor who's so incredibly knowledgeable and humble and really not only focused on their own personal development as an instructor, but happy to go introspection, into introspection and self-review and to analyze themselves and who want to constantly grow and learn and take inspiration from all different areas and aren't afraid to have mentors to support their own personal growth and development and can take strong feedback and want to, want to improve their writing. I know this is crazy because I haven't even gone into the technical level of writing yet, have I, or their teaching delivery. But I just think when all of those those are covered, then you look at your technical writing level. I think that I always think I can improve a person's technical writing level anyway. So to me, if the personality is right, and the when we go back to that will, remember I talked about the magic moment, when you go back to that will where there's that openness and willingness to learn, I think every instructor has the ability to be exceptional if they're interested in mastery. Uh, and so, yeah, technical performance is, is important. Understanding the human body, how now that works is really important. And then those teaching deliveries and teaching skills, you know, people who are able to communicate you know, and have find that rapport with their students and, um, you know, really quickly make a connection with someone. I think that's what really makes a good instructor. Not so much the one who, who thinks is great and, and can do it all. And, and someone who takes so much pride in their work and, and just gets off on being a mentor and a role model and inspiration for new generations coming through. And I had a moment recently and it just touched my heart so much. It was a couple of years ago and I was in Tux doing a level three teach. And this kid, well, he's not really a kid, he's an adult now, um, came running over to me and gave me this big hug. It was like, well, now I can't believe it. I can't believe I've seen you again. I'm like, who's this kid? <laughs> um, <laughs> I had no idea who it was. And he's like, yeah, remember me, do you? And I'm like, so sorry, no, I don't. And he goes, man, because of you, I snowboard now and he was on the basic level three, just done base level three tech and teach. And I taught him as a beginner and he said, you inspired me so much to snowboard and it's Stu us and he's killing it now in his freestyle. And, um, you know, he's, a, he's, a, he's really an inspirational rider and, and a great guy. But I think, I think, I think I love that, you know, I love that moment when someone comes up to you and you, you know, goes, thanks so much. You got me into snowboarding and you inspired me to, to be a snowboarder and, and, and you believed in me when no one else did. And thanks. I love that. So I think that's what makes a great instructor. Yeah. I, I love seeing like, um, customers, um, who have like taught like on their like beginner lessons in the dome and then seeing them like a couple of like weeks or a month afterwards and just seeing this right in the recreation I'm like oh sick and you just go have a little fist bump with them and you're just like sick turns around there you're just like you're just the, seeing the atmosphere and the, the stoke from them is, is super cool to see um and I really I mean, love that it's awesome isn't it that's yeah. just the the joy of teaching isn't it to its core and I mean imagine that times you know another sort of well I've been teaching now for 23 years and I can't seem to go anywhere without running into someone you know <laughs> it was even in Japan and someone's going hey now <laughs> so sitting on the side of the slope and even so example Ben Ben Kinnear bless him he's the um, team GB coach a few years back he brought the um, juniors out freestyle squad and even in that group the Coltest boys and that three of them in his group of I think he had eight or nine Three of them in that group I've taught before and taught them on their <laughs> journey, you know. Nice. So it's, it's, yeah, it's awesome. I sort of mentored Ben as well and talked him into becoming a snowboard instructor as opposed to going down the professional road as well. I'm so glad I did. So, yeah, I guess, I guess that's one of the biggest pluses and true joys of the job, isn't it? Not only to, you know, come across people loving the sport, but also seeing how far they're going to go. 
can't wait to run into you in 10 years time to yeah, see what you're yeah. up to you know <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we'll de- I'll definitely cross paths with you for sure. I think um, you'll see me in teens now and again, and be like, "Who hey, now?" And you're like, "Who's that guy?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah, I've actually even had guys like that who I've been delivering a course and examining, and and then I'll see. I'll never forget your writing, Max. I recognise everybody, and and I'm sort of well, I do this sort of secret filming, and I'll film them and send them a little <laughs> video. Go, I saw you. Like, I haven't taught them for two years. You know, I'm like, I saw you. I'm out of <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah so good. it's a small that's one thing i small will say world, everyone yeah. out there in the snowboard instructor industry is oh my gosh be careful what you do because it's such a small world you know it really is you run into everyone all around <laughs> yeah it, it is it's it's mad how small it is and you just like you post um saying like oh, i'm i'm in this resort and then everyone's just like you people you know like oh i'm in there as well let's, let's have a shred and you're just like oh great cool <laughs> It's, it's really cool to see, to be fair. Um, yeah, yeah, let's um, let's kind of wrap it all up. Um, contacts, plug yourself in, Renal. Um, where can we find you with fresh snowboarding, social media, um, all that kind of jazz, really? Oh, thank you, Max. Um, so I am freshsnowboarding.com website. Uh, on Insta, although I haven't really been active that much recently, which is... I should have been, but I've just been really enjoying some family time over Christmas um, and over this period for the first time in forever. So Instagram is fresh, F-R-E-S-H, and then snowboard, S-N-W-B-R-D. So fresh snowboard Insta, and I have a fresh snowboarding Facebook page as well. Oh, great. So, yeah, I know, I get in contact. Yeah.